my name is Anaïs Marin. I'm an associate fellow with uh, Chatham House and also the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation with Human Rights in Belarus. And it is my pleasure to welcome you today at uh, this panel uh, dedicated to trying to answer the question, what can the West do about uh, human rights abuses in Belarus? I just uh, would like to give the floor to Richard uh, Astapenia, who has a few introductory remarks to share with you. Thanks a lot, Anais. Good afternoon, everyone. It's the first event that we organized at the Belarus Initiative, so we owe a little explanation. Actually, Chatham House, Chatham House has done a lot of work on Belarus over the last 18 months, including almost a dozen of research events and almost a dozen of, of expert comments that were published on the website. But with the Belarus initiative, we would like to structure our work. This initiative was announced by Chatham House uh, with the Global Affairs Canada. And this project is implemented with the Center for New Ideas. And we would like to structure our research and convenient work in support of political transformation and human rights uh, protection in Belarus. Over the next two years, we plan to extensively publish on Belarus, including opinion polls, including a research paper on gender issues, expert comments, etc. And of course, to serve as a convenient platform for events like this one. Thanks to that, we hope to keep Belarus slightly high in the policy community's agenda and to be a resource for stakeholders in formulating recommendations that will help international actors and of course Belarus to go through the current crisis. So if you have any ideas or suggestions about Belarus initiative, please uh, contact me. Finally, we run uh, various monitoring exercises within the Belarus initiative. So now you can see on your screen a short Zoom poll popping up. Uh, please do answer the questions as it will be very helpful for us. And that's it. Thanks a lot, Anais, for giving the floor. I will introduce uh, our first speaker, Alias Beliatsky, and ask him to speak for about 10 minutes. That would be the rule for each speaker. Um, and uh, then we will open the floor for uh, Q&A and uh, discussion. You are welcome to post your comments or questions in the chat uh, using the chat function. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, please raise your hand and I will try and uh, give you the floor during that hour which will be left for us uh, for uh, discussion. Uh, let me remind also that this meeting is held on the record, uh, meaning that the recording will be released on uh, Chatham House website at some point. Um, so I uh, wish you all an interesting panel and I will uh, right now uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Alias Bielatsky, although he might not uh, need an introduction. Uh, Alias is a scholar of Belarusian literature who made himself famous already back in the 1990s, being very in, much involved in the Belarusian Popular Front and um, uh, various uh, initiatives in defense of uh, democracy and human rights in Belarus. He has founded in 96 uh, the uh, NGO Vyasna, which is for many of us uh, the, the most serious and reliable source of information about ongoing human rights violations uh, in Belarus. And uh, Vyasna has been uh, denied registration since 2003 and is operating under um, a number of constraints, which, which eventually have uh, uh, caused problems to, to Alias himself, who, who spent almost three years in, uh, in prison uh, some 10 years ago. Um, uh, I would uh, now ask you, Alias, to please give us an overview of the situation with human rights and the abuses, uh, um, the panorama of the abuses that have been observed for the past year, and what would be your suggestion as to what the West can and should do to make sure that uh, the violations stop and do not reoccur. You have the floor for 10 minutes, Alex. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Добрый день, я буду говорить по-русски. Ситуация у нас, к сожалению, продолжает ухудшаться. Я думаю, что те, кто следят за новостями в Беларуси, они это прекрасно ощущают. 
По моим наблюдениям, не только моим, мы сейчас находимся на пике репрессий. Более того, недавно, несколько дней назад, министр иностранных дел Макей заявил о том, что власти намерены полностью уничтожить гражданское общество в Беларуси. И это было заявлено впервые, никогда до этого не доходило. И это показывает всю серьезность того общественно-политического кризиса, который продолжается в Беларуси, начиная с лета прошлого года. Его заявление можно расценивать как шантаж перед принятием Европейским Союзом и США очередного, очередных пакетов санкций, или же как э, план, потому как его предказания достаточно часто сбываются. Э, напомню, что с августа прошлого года через репрессии в Беларуси прошло уже более 35 тысяч человек, и это число, этот процесс давления на гражданское общество, он продолжается. Только в марте, в прошлом месяце 2021 года по политическим мотивам, по нашим подсчетам, были задержаны 1139 человек. Постоянно проходят уголовные суда, суды, суды, которые имеют политическую подоплеку. В прошлом месяце было осуждено 105 человек по такого рода уголовным делам, и ни один человек не был оправдан. 79 человек поехали в колонию в места заключения. Остальные также были наказаны другими, другими наказаниями, не связанными с лишением свободы. И примерно такое же число осужденных сейчас происходит каждый месяц, вот уже три месяца мы наблюдаем такую тенденцию. Примерно около ста человек проходит через суды. Сотни заключенных, которые сейчас находятся в СИЗО, еще ждут, в своей очереди ждут судов. Все время, практически каждый день происходят новые аресты, обыски, допросы. Мы констатируем и записываем продолжающиеся пытки и нечеловеческое обращение с задержанными. В то же время Следственный комитет не возбудил ни одного уголовного дела по фактам пыток протестующих. Несколько сот заявлений сейчас лежат в Следственном комитете. И более того, идут угрозы людям, которые написали эти заявления о том, что они могут быть привлечены сами к уголовной ответственности. Год назад в это время в Беларуси было всего три политических заключенных. Сегодня белорусское правозащитное сообщество насчитывает 354 человека. И это число постоянно, каждую неделю растет. Среди них находятся и мои коллеги, семь, семеро правозащитников и 12 журналистов. Возбуждено уголовное дело против активистов, Правозащитного центра «Весна», БАЖа, Белорусского Хельсинского комитета, независимого профсоюза РЭП по 342 статье Уголовного кодекса нас э, обвиняют. Пока что количество э, подозреваемых в, эти, в этом деле 4 человека, но список еще не закрыт, дело идет. Нас обвиняют в финансировании и в участии в действиях, которые грубо нарушают общественный порядок. Параллельно ухудшается законодательство в сфере прав и свобод граждан. Недавно был принят в первом чтении закон о противодействии экстремизма, который разрешает властям практически любую неподконтрольную общественную или же политическую деятельность на основании этого закона преследовать в уголовном порядке. Прошли изменения в закон о внутренних войсках, им разрешили применять оружие по усмотрению. Вот это значительно расширяет э, возможность применения боевого оружия против мирных демонстрантов. Э, внесены изменения в закон о массовых мероприятий, мероприятиях, которые практически э, вернули его в... Э, очень плохое состояние, и, и, и планируется изменение в Трудовой кодекс, который также запрещает э, рабочим, работающим э, принимать участие в забастовках 
по месту работы. В стране фактически не объявлено чрезвычайное положение. Хотя оно не объявлено, но сама ситуация мне очень напоминает то, что происходило когда-то в Польше в начале 80-х лет с тысячами людей, которые были интернированы, с прекращением фактически гражданских прав и свобод, невозможностью проведения ни мирных собраний, ни мирных э, акций с э, огромным давлением на независимую прессу и независимые неправительственные организации. Э, в стране практически правовой дефолт, власти действуют по целесообразности, и основная цель, конечно же, не допустить изменений, сохранить и укрепить существующий режим. Что мы ждем в этой э, безотрадной и довольно страшной ситуации, которую Беларусь не переживала никогда? Мы впервые столкнулись с такого уровня кризиса, с такого уровня репрессиями и с такого уровня давления на гражданское общество, которое просто убивают на наших глазах. Беларусь является соседкой Европейского Союза. И сейчас происходит уничтожение всех ростков демократии в Беларуси. Есть ли понимание у Запада этого? Согласен ли Запад с этим? Готов ли Запад это терпеть? Мало только принимать политических беженцев, нужно незамедлительно действовать. И я убежден, что оказание сильного комплексного давления на белорусские власти может принести положительный результат. Основная цель, которая сейчас, как мне видится, стоит и перед нами, и перед моими коллегами-правозащитниками, это остановить репрессии, начать внутринациональный диалог при посредничестве нейтральной стороны. Ну и в конце концов добиться демократических изменений. Мы давно говорим о том, что Запад должен предложить что-то белорусским гражданам, несмотря на позицию белорусских властей. И это предложение могло бы быть упрощенный порядок получения виз и в ближайшей перспективе безвизовый режим. Белорусский режим держится при полной поддержке со стороны России, ну и устойчивости перспективы демократии и в Беларуси, и в наших соседних странах Восточной Европе, конечно же, зависит от того, насколько Россия может помешать этому процессу. Спасибо. Спасибо, Алис. Спасибо uh, very much. We have seen uh, from uh, what was just said that the number of human rights abuses is indeed rising. And they continue in a climate of lawlessness and, and impunity, even for the most uh, serious ones. And we're talking, for example, about uh, torture. Uh, as Alias has reminded, uh, the, there is a trend towards the criminalization of uh, victims of human rights abuses, but also uh, journalists or lawyers or uh, human rights defenders who get arrested every day as we speak. And in parallel, we can also notice um, the legalization of practices which have multiplied over uh, the last six months. And I'm here uh, referring specifically to uh, the new law uh, on extremism, which is used to uh, silence uh, dissenters and eventually, as Alice said, to uh, uh, simply make civil society disappear in the country. Um, I would like, like now to give the floor to um, uh, Mr. Uh, Kavalewski, Kavalewski uh, Valier, who is uh, an ex-Belarusian diplomat who has uh, worked in the United States as a country analysis uh, consultant for Freedom House uh, and uh, who ha uh, who's been also a consultant for the World Bank. And he joined last December the office of uh, Mrs. Svetlana Tsikhanovska as a representative on international affairs. Um, Mr. Kavalevsky has uh, kindly agreed to um, replace uh, the speaker who was initially uh, uh, supposed to, to, to join us uh, today uh, and, and who couldn't, unfortunately. So thank you for this, uh, uh, Valeri, and you have uh, 10 minutes to address this uh, issue of what do you think the West uh, could or should do uh, to stop human rights abuses in your country? Thank you. 
thank you, Anais, and thank you, Chatham House, for inviting me uh, to uh, to this discussion. Um, uh, I would like to also thank Alice for kind of laying out the landscape of the situation in Belarus as it stands now. Uh, literally, like, if you compare the events in uh, August or September last year, when there was a jubilation, where there was a lot of openness, a lot of freedom, a lot of uh, kind of sense of, of the coming change uh, in Belarus on the streets among people, uh, and you compare it with the situation today, uh, the one of darkness, the one of hopelessness. Uh, this is this is a deliberate attempt uh, of Lukashenko to to destroy hope uh, among people, and uh, we should not make mistake about the intention of uh, of Lukashenko and his regime that he wants to destroy the protest movement altogether. And everybody who has ever dared to speak against him or act against him or even think about him, uh, against him. Everyone uh, will face uh, the consequences. Uh, Lukashenko wants to reach out to everybody and he is making this in a very pointed manner. Uh, so the, the human rights in Belarus is the obvious target right now of, uh, of the actions of Lukashenko's regime. And uh, in any other country, in any other system, democratic institutions would be a barrier uh, to this kind of uh, behavior. But unfortunately, all our democratic institutions have collapsed. Uh, we speak about the rule of law, we speak about the independent judiciary, uh, governmental institutions like uh, the parliament uh, has been voiceless and completely silent on all the abuses. People who've been elected, kind of elected uh, to, to represent people, to protect people, to guarantee the, the rule of law and uh, the, the constitution uh, of Belarus, uh, they have been silent altogether. Uh, moreover, uh, they have uh, essentially rubber stamped all the decisions that have been suggested by the government, by the regime uh, to sort of normalize or legalize uh, the, uh, the lawlessness um, on the streets of Belarus. And so the, um, the important feature of the Belarusian protest of 2020 was that <clears throat> Belarusians probably for the first time ever kind of undertook this uh, this uh, task of bringing change in their country on their on on themselves and uh, they have been champions of this ever since uh, kind of if previously we saw that the west was sort of a champion of democratic change in belarus this time it has changed uh, uh, completely so belarusians have been driving this and we also realized that uh, it is uh, up for belarusians to resolve the situation in belarus therefore the internal process protest in Belarus, internal pressure on the regime uh, has been the most important factor uh, in bringing the change. Unfortunately, as a result of these repressions, as a result of these deliberate actions, uh, the protest uh, has, has been reduced. Uh, but probably I would say that uh, the visibility of protest has been reduced. Uh, at the same time, the protest potential, the willingness of people to protest uh, stays the same and stays very, very high. Like if, uh, uh, if we suggest this experiment to the regime, uh, just take, your, take the police out of the streets uh, for one day only, any day, any day of the week, and allow people to go out and uh, show, show their will, show, express uh, their um, kind of opinion uh, about the events in Belarus. I'm absolutely confident that there would be hundreds of thousands of people on any given day if there was no such uh, repression. Nevertheless, uh, what we see now is this reduced visibility of protest. And the protest has evolved, but it is not visible as it used, uh, as it used to be. And this, of course, affects uh, the willingness, the resolve of uh, international community uh, to react, uh, to act uh, stronger, to act uh, in more practical ways. Therefore, uh, in these conditions, uh, the uh, kind of the, the value of internal uh, pressure uh, has, has reduced. Uh, uh, at the same time, external pressure is more important than before. Uh, so what we do, we work with, uh, in the office of Svetlana Tikhanovska, we work with uh, uh, national governments, we work with uh, multilateral organizations uh, to ramp up pressure, uh, to, to make sure that the uh, political uh, position, the policies um, are consolidated uh, across, uh, across our friends, uh, democratic countries. Uh, the most kind of prominent role uh, would, would belong to a European Union, uh, to the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, 
uh, they have all introduced sanctions, they have adopted specific measures. Um, several other countries also adopted uh, some of the policies, uh, joined, this, uh, joined this collective effort. Uh, Ukraine, Serbia, Switzerland, uh, other countries who have sort of um, uh, joined the policies that were adopted by the international community. Um, in terms of human rights, uh, we, we have aimed to establish accountability mechanisms and uh, uh, among them were, was uh, the, the follow-up to the Moscow Mechanism Report uh, established, uh, um, produced by the OSC group. <clears throat> uh, there was one recommendation to, uh, uh, to set up an accountability mechanism uh, and uh, several countries, uh, Denmark, Germany and the United Kingdom initiated this process and uh, on March 24th, uh, this mechanism was, was launched. Officially, uh, human rights organizations in Belarus joined the effort as, as the co-founders and the uh, co-leads uh, co co uh, of the effort. Uh, the, uh, this mechanism would collect uh, the evidence of human rights abuses, uh, would process this data, verify this data, and uh, prepare this data for, uh, for later use by investigation. But is uh, a human rights commission uh, in the United Nations uh, in March also adopted the resolution uh, to set up this group of experts who would use the the evidence uh, collected by the accountability mechanism uh, to uh, compile it into, uh, into criminal cases, uh, which would later be used for the prosecution of those implicated in this in these crimes. <clears throat> Uh, so monitoring uh, the situation in Belarus, speaking about the situation uh, in, in Belarus, keeping uh, the human rights agenda in Belarus uh, high uh, on the international uh, politics agenda is, is very important. So we, we call on uh, um, national governments, but also uh, uh, international organizations uh, to continue uh, speaking about this uh, during the session of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe next week. Uh, there will be two resolutions uh, considered, uh, one of the on the general uh, situation on human rights. Uh, the other one uh, is about the electoral process uh, in, in Belarus. And uh, uh, the, the election has been the ultimate goal uh, of, uh, of the protest uh, in Belarus. All democratic forces uh, have this goal as uh, as the uh, as the destination uh, for for all the efforts, and uh, it is very important that Council of Europe speaks about this in very practical and technical terms. Uh, in general, our uh, our strategy now uh, with the international community uh, is to consolidate the efforts of uh, national governments, of uh, international organizations, uh, to underscore uh, to Lukashenko, but also to Russia. Uh, that the point of no return for Lukashenko has passed as, as a legitimate leader of Belarus, that he, he will not be accepted back uh, to the international family as, as a legitimate leader of, of Belarus. Uh, it's, uh, it's crucial for, uh, for national governments, especially uh, to send a clear message to Russia uh, that any attempts by Moscow uh, to abuse the situation uh, uh, in Belarus, to abuse the weakness of Lukashenko uh, in order to establish a stronger control over the processes uh, in Belarus would not be tolerated. Any agreements uh, to, uh, to strengthen the integration processes uh, between Belarus and Russia or any uh, financial obligations by Lukashenko any uh, contracts to sell state-owned uh, enterprises to, to Russia or to any other government will not be uh, considered valid and will be revoked. So this should stop Russia from entertaining the idea that they could uh, um, sort of uh, use the weakness of Lukashenko to, uh, to bring Belarus closer to itself, to undermine its sovereignty and independence. Unfortunately, Russia has been uh, the, uh, the major factor. Uh, in uh, uh, strengthening the resilience of Lukashenko to uh, internal and external pressure. And uh, uh, therefore, Russia deserves uh, to be on the stand as, uh, as, as a very specific factor that should be uh, deterred uh, in worsening the situation uh, in Belarus. One final thought uh, is that it is very important now to uh, to ensure the consistency of policies of, of all the national governments uh, of Western democracies. Uh, 
uh, we've seen it uh, before uh, when uh, good policies were adopted, uh, sanctions were adopted uh, on the regime, but later they would be lifted uh, uh, sort of halfway uh, to the destination, uh, to the objectives of, of those sanctions, of those policies. It was most obvious in 2010 uh, when EU and US reacted uh, swiftly uh, to the developments in Belarus, to the crackdown of, after the 2010 uh, elections. Uh, sanctions were introduced, but just several years later, uh, they were lifted uh, and uh, the government has not, uh, the regime in Belarus has not implemented any measures that would constitute systemic changes uh, in the democratic governance in human rights practices. Uh, it, it happened because of the Crimea annexation, because of the Russia's uh, in, uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so Belarus has, or Lukashenko rather, uh, was given a chance uh, to sort of uh, uh, to normalize relations with the West. But uh, in return to these lifted sanctions, uh, he has not produced any meaningful changes, systemic changes in the governments of the country. So this should not happen uh, any longer. Uh, uh, we should make sure that um, the changes are real, uh, that uh, democratic institutions are restored and human rights practices uh, are performed in normal manner uh, in Belarus. I'll stop here and I will welcome your questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valier, and uh, thank you also for reminding of what actually is being done, even if uh, for some it might sound as too little, too late, but uh, indeed the, there were some groundbreaking developments uh, one month ago uh, with the uh, launching of this uh, international accountability platform for Belarus, which you mentioned as a continuation, as a follow-up to the OSC um, Moscow mechanism, so it would be seen as, as the NGO-led uh, platform to uh, to give a chance to all those who are already involved in the gathering, in the collection and gathering and securing of all the data about human rights abuses. So this is a job which is being done and which will now be indeed coordinated uh, by um, a Danish <clears throat> NGO, uh, Dignity. And uh, the second, of course, uh, mechanism which has been launched uh, uh, at the uh, UN level, at the Human Rights Council level, uh, with the adoption of, of a new resolution on, on Belarus, which uh, gives the Human Rights Commissioner, Mrs. Bachelet, a uh, mandate to continue collecting and monitoring and reporting on the situation, but uh, also in, uh, establishes a group of experts. There will be three independent experts uh, who will be tasked as soon as uh, there will be uh, the, the, the financial and material means will be there, it's not uh, uh, the case now, uh, they will indeed uh, follow up on what on the work done by the NGO community to hold the perpetrators of uh, the most serious abuses uh, accountable for uh, these crimes. And uh, I imagine that after uh, one year of ongoing uh, escalation of violations, this is all what we are now uh, looking uh, forward to. Um, I would now give the floor um, <clears throat> to Jörg Forbrick. Uh, Jörg uh, is a political scientist uh, who joined the German Marshall Fund of the United States in 2002. He's based in uh, GMF's office in Berlin where he heads um, the um, uh, Eastern, uh, Central and Eastern U Europe department. And as a senior fellow, he regularly publishes academic and uh, policy advocacy papers uh, on Eastern European issues at large, including uh, Russia. And he also leads uh, GMF efforts to assist civil society and in Belarus and works closely on other projects meant to uh, bolster democracy assistance uh, to the region at large. So uh, the floor is yours uh, for 10 minutes. Jorg, and uh, please share your thoughts on what could or should be done uh, to uh, stop these human rights abuses in Belarus. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anais. Uh, many thanks also to Chatham House for putting this together, especially to Odeho uh, and the, the initiative on, uh, on Belarus. Apologies. Um, uh, thanks also to Alice and, uh, and Valeria for their, for their remarks so far. And my apologies actually for this shirt that I'm wearing. I hope it doesn't make you all too dizzy. I realize that the next time I have to do better uh, in my sort of selection of shirts. 
Um, now, when thinking about the, uh, the human rights situation in, uh, uh, in Belarus and about what the West can possibly do about this, uh, I think it's, uh, it would make sense uh, to sort of rethink some of our points of departure. <clears throat> the first, I think, is uh, what Alice also, uh, also highlighted. I think we're yet to develop uh, a real appreciation of the, of the drama that, is, uh, that has been unfolding in, uh, in Belarus. Alessa has given us a pretty good account of, uh, uh, of some of the repressions that we've seen. Uh, and he's also basically suggested to us that we need to sort of recast some of our language uh, when, when talking about Belarus. Uh, sort of also in the title of this event, we have human rights abuses. That sounds pretty dry, somewhat neutral. Uh, and I don't think it, it conveys really what, what has happened in the, uh, in the country. Uh, I think what's happened there is uh, basically complete lawlessness. Um, Alice mentions uh, legal default. Um, there are no rights. There are no, uh, there's no due process at all. Instead, what we've seen is a sort of junta style behavior by those who are supposed to protect people. Um, what's happened over the last months is, is more akin to to Pinochet's Chile in the 1970s than to, than to a European country. Uh, I completely agree, it's basically an undeclared state of, a state of martial law uh, with a complete abolition of any, uh, of any rights. Uh, so the war that's been declared by the, by the Lukashenko regime against the, uh, the Belarusian people. And I think some of the things that we've seen uh, come very, very close to crimes against humanity. Uh, so I think what we, uh, what we also need to do in our own language uh, in talking about it, it's, I think we need to we need to escalate this. Uh, we should uh, should move away from some of the more technically uh, sort of sounding terminology, uh, because it also is our job to impress really the the drama that's uh, that's been unfolding there. I think the second thing that I think we need to get uh, sort of uh, get right in a way is uh, is our expectations as to as to where this leads, as to where this is uh, going. I think amongst many in the West, there's a there's a hope still that this crisis can be resolved politically, that there is some form of uh, sort of negotiating a way out of this uh, crisis. Um, if not that, then at least I think there is a hope that the situation may calm down. That um, somehow the uh, regime may show some restraint uh, as it did in the past, uh, perhaps soften again as it did at some stage after uh, the crackdowns in 2006 and 2010. I think these, these hopes uh, are basically unfounded um, and for a number of reasons. Uh, one is I think what we've seen basically bursting out into the open last year in Belarus is a structural conflict. Uh, there's a society that's been sort of steadily modernizing uh, over at least a decade uh, that has sort of established islands of independence, whether economically in the IT industry, whether culturally uh, with a very vibrant cultural scene in the country, in civic life, uh, very obviously also in the media landscape. Uh, so there's been a modernization of, uh, of Belarusian society that's been steadily advancing over the last years, um, certainly the last decade. And at the same time, you have a regime that is basically straight out of the 1970s that has stagnated uh, ever since, uh, that's become fully regressive in the, uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, and these are sort of facing, uh, facing each other. And I think this is a structural conflict that will have to be resolved some, some time. Uh, and it will take basically a transformation of, uh, of a political regime, a complete renegotiation of state society relationships at some stage. Uh, now, this is not in the offing immediately. Um, I think this, this conflict uh, can be frozen for some time and it is being frozen by the regime with, uh, with violence, uh, but it's, it, 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 it's dormant as it were. It will not, uh, it will not disappear uh, this way. Uh, second, I think the Lukashenko regime is very clearly fighting for its, uh, for its survival. Um, it's lost legitimacy amongst sort of major parts of society. Uh, in the past, it did have degrees of legitimacy, also in economic terms, for instance. Um, but I think that's gone. Uh, that political legitimacy is not there anymore. There is no hope of winning back uh, lost parts of society. There's also no economic means to buy back 
uh, society. So uh, I think that that legitimacy is lost for good. Uh, and if you don't have that, then all you have left, left is basically the, the monopoly of power that you, uh, that you can rely on. Um, all of that also means that the, uh, the regime in Minsk can basically not soften. Uh, it cannot liberalize the same way or go more restrained again as, it's, uh, as it did in the past, in my opinion. Uh, because with that lot, loss of legitimacy and that feeling of discontent in, uh, in society, any, any sort of softening of the approach will basically reignite protests very, uh, very quickly. Um, instead, what's happening uh, is basically a systematic hardening of, uh, of the regime's positions and, uh, and policies. I mean, we've heard from, from Ales uh, about the language that's, that's being escalated, uh, Vladimir Mackay, um, a diplomat uh, by position, uh, talking about the destruction of civil society. Uh, we see the criminal proceedings, the trials that will continue for quite some time. Uh, we see the legislation and not only the law on extremism, there are other pieces of law that are being, being prepared and basically uh, are designed to stifle any form of, uh, of civic engagement. Uh, so there is a, there's a hardening uh, of, the, of the positions by the regime. And the last is obviously Russian support, as was mentioned. Um, there's virtually no reason for the Kremlin at the moment uh, to, uh, to, to nudge or force Lukashenko into, into any form of restraint. Uh, instead, I think what's happening in Belarus is uh, quite suits the Kremlin in, uh, in many ways, because it's part of a broader confrontation as they see it in Moscow with, uh, with the West. So if anything, I think our expectation should actually be for a worsening. I'm not entirely sure I agree with Alice that the peak of repressions has reached. Um, I think we, uh, we really at the moment don't really see a trajectory, or I personally don't, uh, for, uh, for an improvement um, of, this, uh, of this situation. And I think, and here again, I agree with Alice uh, about the parallel to Poland in 1981 and the following years. Uh, I think that's what we have to be prepared for. Uh, a years-long standoff between a regime and society um, that is sponsored basically by an outside, uh, by an outside force. Uh, so in that sense, I think we're talking about a very long time for this, uh, for this situation to last. Now, turning to the, uh, to the Western responses, quite some of it has, has been mentioned already, so I think I can be relatively, relatively brief about this. First, I would say, the responses we've seen so far are in principle or were in principle uh, correct and well taken. Um, we've seen that the elections were not acknowledged. We were seen that Lukashenko's claim to power was not, uh, was not accepted by, uh, uh, by Europeans uh, and, and other, other Western powers. Um, we've seen a pretty strong condemnation of the, of the violence, of the arbitrariness that was, was unleashed against Belarusian citizens. Um, I think we've seen quite a strong show of solidarity with, uh, with Belarusian society, with uh, its right to self-determination, um, quite some support to victims of repression, civil society, independent media, uh, and also even if late, uh, a number of sanctions against the regime. So overall, I think these are, uh, these are principally right measures, but overall, I think they were also too slow, too limited, and in many ways too, uh, too dispersed. Uh, when it comes to the non-acknowledgement, uh, I think the first question that I would always have about this is, if you don't acknowledge the power holder in Minsk, uh, how far down do you go with that uh, um, uh, non-acknowledgement? Um, should you not then also freeze or reduce uh, diplomatic contacts, for instance? Uh, should, should you not much more systematically also thin out economic interaction with a, uh, with a regime like that? So, uh, I think the, the declaration of non-acknowledgement is one thing, it's an important signal, but I think it's, uh, it's remained rather not so consequential uh, so far. Uh, second, sanctions. Um, I think we have a very good historical comparison here. Uh, in 2010 or following the 2010 crackdown, about 170 people were put on a, on a personalized sanctions list. Uh, that was at a time when uh, the extent of uh, repressions, if you measure it by detentions, for instance, uh, was about one twelfth of what it is today. Um, instead, what we have today is about half the number of people on the sanctions list. 
So there is clearly a mismatch here between the extent of, uh, uh, of repressions and the uh, extent of sanctions that, has been, that have been rolled out by the, uh, by the European Union in particular. Some countries have gone, gone further than that. Uh, so I think there is a uh, there's a need for uh, uh, for expanding that and quite substantially. Uh, I think uh, there should rather be hundreds of names on the uh, on the personalized sanctions list, and they should be a very good cross section of all of those who bear responsibility what's happening in the country. Uh, they should not be limited only to uh, to some of the security apparatus. I think they need to go much further. Uh, and of course, I think there is uh, a need for a discussion on uh, on economic sanctions. Uh, the United States are likely to reinstate the sanctions that uh, that they had in place, but uh, but suspended for the last years against nine economic entities uh, of the country. I think this is something that, for the Europeans, is certainly worth considering. Unfortunately, there is no indication at the moment that the fourth sanctions package that's being discussed will include any economic entities. Um, let's also be clear, sanctions are not likely to resolve the situation. Um, they can put certain constraints on the regime, they have a signaling effect, uh, but this is not, uh, this is not uh, uh, the single tool, the golden or silver bullet uh, that will help resolve the crisis. Uh, but it can certainly uh, sort of put some restraints also materially on the, uh, on the regime. Uh, when it comes to support for Belarusian society, I think a lot of it has been in the form of declarations. Um, and I do think that we need a lot more also substantial uh, assistance in a whole number of directions. Um, that is victims of political repressions, they are rehabilitation, their legal assistance, uh, that's civil society and independent media that are being completely paralyzed by, uh, by the regime in Minsk. I think there is a need for, for support towards much more uh, uh, sort of targeted support for specific groups in society, whether that's students that have been disenrolled, whether that's journalists, whether it's women, uh, whether it's doctors, workers, uh, the cultural field, entrepreneurs. So I think um, a lot more needs to be done in the way of tailor-made assistance to, to specific uh, social groups. Uh, also, uh, I believe to the much more than ever in the past to the diaspora structures of the democratic movement. Uh, in principle, we're talking about the necessity to establish a sort of parallel Belarusian state outside of the, uh, outside of the country. Um, that acts as a bridge into the country and at the same time also a preparation for the, uh, for the future. That's the only space at the moment where, uh, where that can take place really in a, in a systematic way. Uh, I also think we need much more under the radar support for civil society or individual activists in the country, uh, which is notoriously difficult for, uh, for Western donors to do. Um, some, the EU and some uh, countries, especially Lithuania, Poland, a few others in Central and Northern Europe have started to do that. Um, I think a lot more of that is, uh, is needed, especially also in the long run. Uh, because it's easy, always happens that some of these measures of support are being rolled out in response to a dramatic development, but they dry up within a year or two. So we need a much more longer term sort of uh, basis for support and programming for support than, uh, than we see so far. A word on the international justice effort. Uh, it has been mentioned that this platform, this accountability platform was, uh, uh, was established. I think that's to be welcomed. Um, there are a couple of constraints or a couple of sort of deficits that I, that I see though. Uh, one is, I think it still lacks quite some ownership in the Belarusian human rights community. It's been imposed to some extent from the outside but the buy-in from Belarusian uh, initiatives that have worked for months already on documentation is still limited. So I think there's something to be improved here. Uh, the second is documentation is one thing, uh, but investigation and ev eventually prosecution is equally needed. Uh, some countries are trying to do this within their national jurisdictions. Um, a discussion certainly needed on an international uh, sort of platform, uh, tribunal, whatever you, you call it, uh, because documentation in and of itself uh, is important for the future. But I think the real restraining uh, effect on the, on the regime will come if there's also more systematic investigation into individual cases. 
uh, and perhaps even uh, even prosecution. Um, I had one point here that's been mentioned by Valeri very uh, very well. That is um, uh, the one thing that we also need, uh, sort of sus sustainably, is attention to the country. Um, there's been a lot of attention uh, on Belarus over the last year, and that is very, very good because it used to be a bit of a blind spot in the in the mantle map of, of many in Europe and uh, in, in the West. Uh, but it gets harder and harder to sustain this, uh, this public and also political attention. So I think we need to find mechanisms how we how we keep Belarus on that uh, on that mantle map and sort of uh, anchor it there even more strongly and uh, and regularly because in the end of the day this attention is uh, is a lifeline uh, for people in country um, this is something that I think uh, as soon as a regime uh, like the one in uh, in Minsk sees that uh, the country is dropping off the agenda it feels it has a blank check to uh, uh, to do things its way uh, for as long as there's a, there's strong attention, regular attention on it, I think there's also a degree of restraint that uh, that uh, that you impose. Um, I'm going to skip uh, a couple of points that I have on Russia for the moment and rather leave that uh, leave that for the discussion. Um, overall, I think if you pull all of this together, um, uh, the the seeds are there for a uh, for a comprehensive sort of policy and strategy. Uh, to support Belarusian society. I think on all of these accounts, you, uh, we need more and long term. Uh, I also think that uh, the, uh, the setting, the political setting, uh, is actually quite, quite favorable for that. Uh, I think uh, Belarus has, uh, has inspired a lot, of, uh, a lot of hope amongst many in, uh, in Europe. There's something to, uh, to work with here. Uh, it's not the sort of uh, gray news or unfortunate news we always receive uh, from other parts of the world, including Eastern Europe, but I think there was something very inspiring in this. Uh, and there's quite a lot of, a lot of willingness amongst, uh, amongst Europeans in particular to, to engage here in support. I think the second, second is that obviously the, the political change in the White House in Washington is, uh, is important. Uh, democracy is much higher on the agenda of the of the new administration. Central and Eastern Europe is much more on the agenda again uh, of the administration, and the willingness to also coordinate with with uh, with the Europeans is uh, is much higher. So, I think there is uh, there is quite a good transatlantic setting uh, uh, for support here. Um, so, Eric, may I ask yes, you to I'm wrap done. up, please? I'm that, done. that was it. Um, <laughs> The, what I mean to say with all of this is that uh, we don't even uh, we don't actually have to be too sort of skeptical about uh, 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 about Western policies and their and their future here because I think the uh, the the overall prospects are quite good. We just have to do something with it, and I think all the uh, the points where we need to act are on the table. Thanks, Anais. <laughs> Thank you, Jorga. I was I really couldn't interrupt you because what you were saying was absolutely topical and, and interesting. And thank you for reminding about the uh, necessity for, for humanitarian assistance uh, in the first place. And um, uh, also, of course, about these uh, international mechanisms. And because this is, of course, uh, the, the, the main hope that, that we have now and, and this issue of, of um, uh, ownership is extremely important. So at some point, uh, if Alias is still with us, I would maybe uh, like uh, him to comment on, on this and on how he sees this international platform and how uh, they could be coordinated uh, with what is being done inside Belarus under um, extremely difficult conditions. Um, but uh, maybe for uh, for the time being, I uh, would like to ask uh, James uh, Nexi, who uh, raised his hand to unmute himself and uh, ask a question, <coughs> please. Thank you, Anais. Um, yeah, my name is James Nixi. I, I work with Anais and Rihor uh, on the Russia and Eurasia program at Chatham House. And uh, yeah, let me add my congratulations to Rihor for getting this Belarus initiative off the ground. Uh, you know, it's, that's uh, no mean feat. Um, I'd like to ask a question of Mr. Kavalievsky, if I may, um, and it's quite a personal one. I hope you don't mind. But so you you worked for the regime. Now you work against the regime. And I wondered a little bit about your personal journey. What is it that turned you, if you like? Was it a gradual process or was it over a period of time? And I don't ask not in order to be personal, because I wonder if others who 
are now in your former position, if you like, um, mm -hmm. could be persuaded to, how do I put this, defect, if you don't mind my saying so, in the same way that you have. Is that possible? Is it a likelihood? Is it viable? Is it, is it advisable? Um, so your own journey, I suppose I'm asking, and is it transferable onto others? Thank you for the question. Uh, not, not very often that I receive personal questions, but I'm, I'm glad to share. Like I resigned from diplomatic service of Belarus 15 years ago, exactly. Uh, that happened in 2006 when Lukashenko uh, elected himself to the third term. Uh, in my own humble opinion, it was not right. Uh, it was anti, uh, un undemocratic. Uh, nobody asked me about my opinion, but nevertheless, I decided that I will take a stand and uh, resign from diplomatic service. I loved the job. I did well uh, in my job, and uh, but there was one flaw that I had to work for, for the wrong man. And unfortunately, in diplomatic service of Belarus back then, and increasingly uh, through the years until now, uh, this... Uh, uh, this element of, of personal of Lukashenko has been growing more and more and more and kind of replacing national interests, national considerations of national interests of Belarus. And so, which is absolutely visible today uh, that we, um, we see that there is uh, the, the sovereign, the independent, the national uh, has disappeared uh, from, the, uh, from the conversation, uh, from the uh, activities of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, so what I do now uh, is the uh, is the ultimate um, combination of diplomatic uh, skills uh, of diplomatic activity. I've I've never been exposed to so much activities of diplomatic nature uh, in all my life. Uh, so uh, I've I've been doing probably uh, for for these four months uh, more than ever. Uh, but I'm doing this for the right cause, uh, unlike previously, unlike in the official diplomatic service. And uh, I would definitely recommend anyone who is willing to join the effort, uh, resign from diplomatic service or uh, join from the outside. Uh, I would definitely welcome that. I know that there are many diplomats who, who have resigned from the diplomatic service of Belarus after um, uh, the crackdown. And uh, I think this is the right moment to do this, uh, to join the effort, uh, to work uh, together. Uh, on bringing the change in Belarus. This is probably not the perfect chance, but this is the best chance we've had in, in decades uh, to change the situation, to get rid of, of this cancer uh, on the body of Belarus. Uh, so this, this, um, this transition has been easy for me. Uh, as soon as I saw Svetlana Tsikhanovska as the leader of Belarus, I did not hesitate a second. Uh, even though the risks are obvious, uh, the challenge is... Uh, is really complex, uh, but um, again, this is the best chance we've had, and uh, this is the right leader we have now uh, to to follow. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I would uh, like now to ask uh, Alias about this issue of ownership that was uh, evoked by by Jörg, and um, I'm, I'm very much interested as well in this. Uh, coordination, cooperation, uh, possibly competition between the various mechanisms and initiatives that have been launched for over a year now uh, in Belarus proper, and now at the international level with this international accountability platform for Belarus. How do you see interaction with uh, this platform, with uh, Dignity um, NGO? Um, uh, fr from your perspective, please, Elias. Ну, я согласен, да, я согласен с этой общей картиной, которую нарисовал Йорк. Я считаю, что это правильный путь. И нужно просто не, не забывать ни на минуту про то, что у нас происходит, и двигаться шаг за шагом. И создание этой платформы неправительственных организаций по э, собранию сведений о э, пытках в Беларуси и анализу этих сведений – это один из таких э, шагов. И он э, хорошо э, работает или будет работать вместе с тем механизмом, который создан Советом по правах человека ООН при Верховном комиссаре по расследованию э, ситуации с пытками в Беларуси. 
И мне кажется, они будут дополнять один одного, но это достаточно быстрое решение, оно принималось достаточно быстро, и сейчас идет обсуждение уже технических деталей, как будет работать этот механизм. Белорусские организации подключены к платформе неправительственных организаций, правозащитные белорусские организации. Ну и, кстати, уже некоторые из, из белорусских организаций, из правозащитников уже имеют с этим проблемы, потому что власти тоже нервно относятся к такой информации. Недавно был проведен обыск у юристки Ниры Броницкой, которая представляет Human Constant, одну из белорусских правозащитных организаций. Ее вызывали в Следственный комитет. И, как мы понимаем, основная тема этого допроса, который был проведен, как раз и работа белорусских правозащитников по сборе похоже, такой информации. Но информации достаточно много, и, в принципе, нужно иметь в виду, что, во-первых, очень много информации выставляли сами люди и продолжают выставлять в своих пабликах. Это же делают журналисты, которые постоянно берут интервью, записывают видео людей, которые проходят через пытки или нечеловеческое обращение и в предыдущие месяцы сейчас. Это делают и правозащитные белорусские организации. Этой информацией делятся и белорусские беженцы, люди, которые, которых пытали, которые были ранены, которые сейчас находятся за границей. Поэтому объем информации он достаточно большой, его сейчас как-то скрыть или спрятать белорусским властям не получится. И то, что уже мы собрали, достаточно для того, чтобы начать процесс анализа и э, прийти к определенным выводам даже без нашего участия. Вот. Ну и поэтому сейчас очень важный этап работы аналитиков, тех людей, которые будут работать с этой информацией, систематизировать ее, обрабатывать и... Мы надеемся, что через какое-то время мы получим достаточно ясную картину с названиями людей, которые отдавали приказы о массовых репрессиях и пытках, и которые принимали участие в этих пытках. И это очень важно для белорусского общества, потому как белорусское общество получило очень серьезную коллективную травму. Ничего похожего у нас не было со времени войны. Во время войны были такие пацификации белорусских городов, деревень, когда забирали всех людей, все люди подвергались там пыткам или же каким-то каким репрессиям. Сейчас мы имели такой же неизбирательный подход, массовый подход, главная цель которого была запугать белорусское общество, загнать людей опять по домам, вот поднять этот уровень страха, который исчез в эти месяцы. Вот, поэтому вот эта травма и это желание людей добиться справедливости, оно, наверное, будет главным двигателем в этом процессе. Посмотрим, ну, опять же, какие будут результаты. Я думаю, что все-таки вот мне лично кажется, что эти материалы будут очень важны при уже разбирательстве в самой Беларуси, но, тем не менее, очень важно, чтобы они были сейчас собраны, систематизированы и чтобы эта база информации была готова к дальнейшему употреблению, потому как это является процессом достижения справедливости, вот, который сейчас у нас отсутствует, но белорусское общество хочет, чтобы это произошло. Thank you, Alice. Uh, given what you just said, I think it's the right moment to raise um, the one of the questions that was asked in the chat. I know three people raised their hands. I will give them the floor uh, right after that. But first, maybe Jörg could comment on, on uh, this question by uh, Craig Oliphant, uh, which is addressed to all the panelists. But still, I think you're maybe in the best position to tell us what are the, uh, in, in practice, uh, the, the, the best a practical funding to be ensured to reach people, which, which uh, solutions uh, are best received um, and local initiatives uh, can, can benefit from um, targeted support in the field of civic education, psychological support, 
uh, legal aid, gender issues, etc. Maybe you can tell us more about your experience in that field, please. Certainly, I'll be happy to do that. Um, I think, first of all, uh, the sort of restrictions on uh, any activity inside of the country are, uh, are extreme at the moment. Uh, I mean, we've seen episodes of sort of very closed, restrictive, hostile uh, conditions in the past, 2011, 12, uh, and typically they, uh, they sort of softened uh, over time. And maybe they will again uh, in a year or two from now. Um, but at the moment, there is uh, very, very little um, that you can support in terms of organized uh, activities inside of the country. So a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the responses also in support of victims of political repressions uh, have to be taken either outside of the country uh, or in many ways, obviously online. Um, uh, when it comes to rehabilitation, when it comes to psychosocial supports, uh, there's a massive need at the moment to uh, uh, to engage in that area, uh, to engage uh, with people who have gone through uh, arrest, torture, and uh, uh, and otherwise treatment by uh, by the police. So I think for the moment, this is actually something we should uh, we should all prioritize. Um, the second thing I think that's important is there's an extreme degree of exhaustion uh, amongst many in, uh, in Belarusian civil society, also in the independent media, uh, after these uh, six, eight months that, uh, uh, um, that are behind them. Uh, whether it's journalists and the sort of the, the massive amount simply of information, the intensity of, uh, uh, of what's happened, uh, the same for, for many in civil society. I think there is a, there is a need for them, uh, for many of them to, uh, to recover from that also, uh, also physically. So here again, I think this is something that in most cases, uh, can be done outside of the country. Uh, so, what I mean to say with these uh, with these examples is, uh, at the moment, I think the the focus should still not uh, be on a sort of long term approach to societal change, whether it's through civic education and so forth. Uh, but at the moment, I think it's still a lot of it is still emergency mode, where you where you where you need to help uh, Belarusian partners to uh, to recover from this situation, also to settle into the new conditions, whether it's inside of the country or for the many who had to leave also outside of the country, uh, before you can uh, move into something that is more sort of forward leaning and, uh, and also systematic. I think a lot of that will still uh, require quite, uh, quite some time to, uh, uh, to come in. Thank you, Jorik. Uh, we have 25 minutes left, so I would now uh, like to take a first round of oral questions uh, in the order that I saw the hands uh, rising and have a first round of answers from the panelists. And if we still have time, then we can have a second round. So please, I would like to first give the floor to Wojtek Kononchuk and then Łukasz Bierski, both from Warsaw. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for these very interesting voices. No, uh, just a few brief comments. It seems that we have a consensus here regarding the uh, assessment of the situation in Belarus. It can be summed up uh, briefly, unprecedented martial law type repression. And I would add also that we are facing in Belarus currently the largest human rights abuse since the war in former Yugoslavia and Chechnya. So it's the picture today. So as the title of this panel is uh, what we can do about this human rights abuse, uh, let me uh, quickly um, give some, uh, um, uh, some uh, advices. Um, I would start that you know, today, uh, your response is definitely far not sufficient. Um, as it was already noticed by York, uh, the EU did more uh, 10 years ago when the situation was much better than it is today. So let's ask a question if already introduced EU measures uh, are efficient? And I think that the uh, answer on this question is definitely no. Situation is worse every day. 
And you know, these EU measures uh, were called by uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska a mockery. And uh, you know, that the regime doesn't care about what, what we have already done. So, you know, during our conversation in last hour, two additional Polish activists of Polish minority in Belarus have been arrested. You know, just a part of a bigger picture about the current situation with human rights in, in Belarus. So, and also let's notice that more sanctions ha uh, have been introduced by Belarusian regime on us than uh, uh, EU measures on Belarusian regime. I will remind just a few uh, moments. Uh, almost all foreign journalist accreditation uh, was expired in October and just very few prolonged. Euronews TV channel was banned just recently. Diplomatic staff of few countries, including Lithuania and Poland, was limited by about 60%. And just recently, a special Belarusian law uh, to impose sanction on, on the West was accepted. So it seems that you know it's uh, it's not an active it's not us who is an active side, but but rather the Belarusian regime. So you know I think that unprecedented uh, situation demands unprecedented approach from the West. We need a system systematic response, um, and you know the recent uh, Vladimir Makier interview is for me a sign that regime is afraid of economic sanctions. Um, so what, what we should do, definitely more visa ban, like there should be hundreds of surnames on the, on the visa ban list, systemic investigation of the human rights abuses. It's interesting idea uh, proposed by York. And here I would add that uh, it's actually already implemented by Lithuanians. And finally, let's uh, think about economic sanctions. If we want to punish this regime, we have to introduce economic sanctions, which is also a point in um, uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska uh, uh, team. They propose it for a few occasions. Thank you. Uh, Lukas Berski, currently Belsat TV, uh, involved in supporting uh, civil society in Belarus since 1990. Uh, eight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's already good that uh, organizations like Chatham House are involved here. Thank you very much, River. Uh, thank you very much, organizers. I would use three words, three key words, according to me. I will explain what I mean. And at the end, I will uh, add, uh, ask a question and I will try to be as brief as possible. Uh, those three words, according to me, are security, endurance, and democracy overhaul. By security, I mean why, why Belarus is important to Europe. According to me, this is because Europe's security depends on Belarus, because Belarus is the only, according to me, in Europe, truly bilingual, bipolar country oscillating between Russia and, um, uh, and Europe. Uh, in terms of values, language, cultural, culturally, uh, and stability and the events that happen in Belarus have direct and will have direct influence on the security of Europe in the future as well. This is, I think, why Belarus should remain high in the agenda. It's good York is saying it, it's high, but this is perhaps an argument that we should also try to strengthen uh, when talking to um, decision makers in Europe, why Belarus is important and why we should take interest in Belarus. The second is endurance. Um, as I mentioned, I was involved in supporting civil society in Belarus. And can you, can you imagine that in, in the course of those years, um, um, as the elections in Belarus went, Various programs would close down, shut down, like uh, uh, the Dutch Matra program, just to reopen after that, or they would limit their uh, support to uh, only officially registered organizations in Belarus, like the Open Society program did with Batori Foundation. Uh, uh, so um, I would say that our support to civil society in Belarus follows the pendulum like oscillations as well. And what is important here is to, 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 to endure, to, to remain with all those programs um, uh, open 
of course, we should scrutinize, we should check how efficient they are, but they should not close um, uh, following this uh, liberalization periods um, and then tightening of the screws in Belarus as well. I would say that here possibilities are, you have mentioned already plenty of them, but there is, uh, there is of course support to independent media. Of course, now I am working with Belsat and I can tell you that I think it's not more than 6% of the Belsat budget comes from other international partners. Other is only Polish government. Uh, uh, th there was always um, uh, and still ongoing discussion about Belarusian University be with the Belarusian language uh, abroad. Uh, this initiative still hasn't been called to life. And I think uh, it should not only be virtual, it, it can be real. Uh, um, um, so th th there are plenty of those initiatives. Um, um, referring to the question at the end, I want to ask also whether the question is whether we could continue the children health improvement programs or perhaps children parents, the human, hum, only humanitarian initiatives. I, I think that this is relevant as well at the, at the current situation, perhaps a point for negotiation with the Belarusian government, whether this programs, those programs could continue. And the second, the, the last, key word I wanted to, uh, to say what I mean, democracy overhaul. As a person involved in promoting democracy uh, in Belarus, I have sometimes this um, awkward feeling of, um, of that, we, that I'm trying to, um, to get rid of a second hand car that I know I have to get rid of and get something better, I don't know clearly why. But, um, um, and of course, I'm referring to the condition of democracy, not only in my home country in Poland, but also in Europe, in Hungary, uh, abroad. Uh, I think that we should also push for general discussion, uh, what are the, the shortcomings of democracy? And here in this dialogue and in those discussions, we should always include Belarusian civil society uh, as the one which now so clearly demands uh, 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 that democratic rules should be uh, implemented in Belarus. And they are still trying to, uh, to defend them. Like for example, Belarusian Association of Journalists, they will have their general assembly on, on the 16th. Uh, in those conditions, you know, uh, it, it's, it's really a beacon of, uh, um, of the defending the democratic rules in conditions that seem imaginable, unimaginable for, for such conveying such a democratic uh, uh, event. Uh, and at the end, as I promise, I'm finishing. The question is perhaps to Alex Bilatsky, maybe to some others from Belarus, whether you think that uh, this humanitarian assistance and uh, talking with authorities, maybe local authorities, the, with uh, MFA, with Marke about um, the, the children relief, uh, uh, health improvement programs, perhaps children, parents, does it make sense? Is it, do you think that, uh, that uh, it, it could fly? Thank you very much. Thank you, Wukash. Um, you don't make my job easier because uh, the questions are, are are actually longer than the answers. We can we don't have much time left, and and um, we are all among well-informed people. So if you allow me, unless the panelists want to react uh, very very shortly on these two very wide uh, uh, comments we just received. I would like to give the floor uh, to uh, my colleague, uh, Orice Lutsevich from, from Chatham House, who has raised the, her hand a long time ago. Well, thank you very much, Anais. I, I would like to defer to other people uh, because uh, we have a lot of important questions. So I just abstain this time. All right, then I will move on to Janet Sotner, uh, the um, ambassador of Canada to, uh, to Poland and Belarus, who is with us today. Uh, 
Hello, Janet. I'm, I'm not the ambassador, and oh, I I'm believe sorry, the ambassador is on the line. <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Kevin is the ambassador. It's always career limiting to be uh, trying to take the place of your uh, supervisor. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. And I did write my my question in the comment. Thank you for, for noticing that. Of course, we're very interested to hear all the reactions today. And I think that the views have been put forward in quite a coherent and clear manner. And, and we do appreciate that. Um, my question had to do around the sanctions. And certainly we, we have heard the various calls on sanctions from, from Pavel Lutushko, from uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's office, uh, others, and and uh, and Canada has enacted sanctions, and we regularly engage with EU and and the US uh, on sanctions issues and trying to coordinate. At the same time, I have heard from other analysts that sanctions are not likely to to have a big effect on the Lukashenko regime. That uh, business leaders don't have particularly uh, uh, levers of power. It's not like other other places and that also the level of in economic integration with countries that are not likely to put in place sanctions means that sanctions will have a certain moral weight and and, um, and, and there will be some effects of sanctions, but that uh, that perhaps it's not going to be a game changer but I, I wouldn't mind hearing if the from from whoever has spoken their views on that and particularly on if there's an area that they think is more vulnerable or more more should be more the focus and target of sanctions uh, partly because also from a government standpoint I know the amount of work that's required to put sanctions in place it's not just a you know, we don't work by fiat where the government can just raid somebody's name on the board and that person doesn't get anything anymore. It ha there has to be a legal case put forward on each individual, each entity. It's, it's a lot, it's so focusing attention is sometimes helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who of the panelists would like to address uh, this issue of economic sanctions? You, please. Sorry. I'm working off two screens and <clears throat> uh, thanks Janet for the uh, for the question. Uh, this debate about sanctions has been going on for as long as uh, there have been situations where you consider sanctions. So um, they are not, and I said this earlier, they're not a silver bullet. They will not resolve uh, uh, a crisis like this. But I think they uh, they have meaning in a uh, in a number of ways. I mean, uh, I think the sanctions that are in place have a symbolic value. Uh, they signal something to Belarusian society. They also signal something to ourselves uh, that sort of there is a there is a position here that that should be taken. Um, they also have to some extent an, an integrating effect, especially in uh, in Europe, because they they also force the Europeans to sort of rally around a, or find a, a common position. Um, <clears throat> Nonetheless, I think Belarus is also an example where sanctions have worked in the past. Uh, if you look at economic sanctions, especially against Bill Niftirim in the in the 2000s, um, they did have an effect in the form of release of political prisoners uh, in uh, in 2008. So, sort of on, on certain points, uh, it seems also that that it does work. I also think logically there is something to be said about sanctions. Uh, and economic sanctions in particular. Um, <clears throat> regimes also have a material base. And Belarus is one that has a very thin material base because it's not a resource-rich country. Um, th there are pressure points uh, that, you can, uh, uh, that you can use in order to reduce the resources available to that regime, uh, resources that are in the end also used for repressive means against society. Um, what are those pressure points? I mean, some are obviously the export products that this country produces, um, oil, refined oil products. Uh, some of it are uh, certainly the, the sort of potash fertilizer products. Some of them are the engineering products. I think we can look at all of those closely uh, and see um, where there is a sort of targeted impact that you can have on uh, uh, on the pockets uh, of the regime. If you wanted to go one step further, one of the capital sort of points that uh, that Belarus has is 
it's an energy transit country. I mean, what prevents us from sort of using that as a pressure point? There are oil and there are gas pipelines running through that country. If you play that right, then you exert pressure not only on Belarus, but also on Russia, because this is Russian energy carriers that, that run through Belarus. Uh, if we wanted to, we could find pressure points. More often than not, I think we're not, uh, uh, we're not willing uh, to go there. There are obviously also our own economic interests in our countries that often speak against that. So if we find all of that too hard, then let's maybe move to another area, which is Belarusian arms uh, industries. Um, there is quite some money that's being earned for Belarus in the area of military service contracts, um, arms trade um, in places like Africa. Perhaps we should look at some of those. So I think there is, uh, there is plenty we can, uh, uh, we can look at, but I think we have to be clear in, uh, in getting our expectations right. Even that will not necessarily um, sort of force the, the regime, a regime that is fighting for its survival, uh, to give up its positions. So, I mean, we, we have a dilemma here, uh, but nonetheless, I think a, a measured, targeted um, uh, approach to sanctions is something that, uh, that should be open for discussion, whatever the very mixed record of, uh, of sanctions that, we, uh, that we're all aware of. Thank you, Jörg. We've had these discussions for so many years already and about always the, 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 the dilemma uh, between uh, harsh sanctions and then another issue which actually has been raised in, in the chat of how to, at the same time, support Belarusian sovereignty and uh, it's always the same dilemma. But I'm sorry to, uh, I apologize to Yulia Miedzewieckaya. We're now going to take that question on Russia uh, and Mikhail Patska either because it would take us uh, too far away from, from our topic of um, today. Uh, so I would like now to give the floor to Vladimir Astapienka. Um, are you with us? Because yes, it's probably more related with the urgent steps that, that we can take or that the West should take with regards to uh, human rights abuse. Please, Vladimir. Uh, hello, Anais. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm really impressed by the level of presentations we have heard, uh, and I know Aless and I know Valeri who are good experts on Belarus, but I was uh, even more impressed by Jörg who sounds like a Belarusian expert on all the things that we have discussed. And I agree with him that we have not reached the peak of the impressions as we sadly joke. We thought we reached the bottom, but then someone knocked from, a, from the beneath. Uh, but I believe that we are in the situation when we shall call a spade a spade. Uh, we have a falsified elections. We have an illegitimate president who seized the power and who basically declared a war against its own population. And we have enough legal grounds, legal arguments to say that he is committing crimes, uh, systematic and massive human rights violations, and uh, 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 even deny, denying the fundamental rights to the population. And we see this protest going on. And uh, this gives us the reason to believe that we see the, t the terrorizing of the population and the crimes against, uh, against uh, mankind. And so this all bring a, a possibility to consider uh, a case of uh, uh, de determining Lukashenko as a terrorist. As you may know, a recent initiative of the authorities was to declare terrorists Svetlana Tikhanovska and Pavel Latushka. And they have the articles that uh, even uh, presume uh, capital punishment under the uh, current uh, Belarusian laws. I believe that it's high time for the international community to really seriously think about that, uh, especially bearing in mind very good suggestion to take unprecedented approaches to the unprecedented crisis that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, would any of the panelists want to uh, reply to what has just been suggested? Valier, I saw you were raising your hand at some point. <clears throat> yes, I was raising my hand uh, to, to, uh, to add to what York said about sanctions, uh, and then I will switch to what Vladimir Stavenka said. Uh, so uh, on sanctions side, uh, just very small uh, aspects of it, uh, that there could be a ban on uh, supplying to Belarus any riot gear, 
any armaments, anything that could be used against protesters, against uh, uh, peaceful demonstrators. And that has been the case. Uh, rubber bullets from Poland, stun grenades from Czech Republic, that has been supplied before. Germany helped train uh, police force to, to deal with uh, uh, mass crowds. That unfortunately was the case. Speaking about the ethical side of sanctions, uh, I know this is a concern for many Western politicians, but what we see now, uh, and this is what has been uh, mentioned by uh, Mr. Kalanchuk, uh, is that there's been a case of internal sanctions, but also not only against uh, Western uh, diplomats, but uh, against Belarusians themselves. Uh, um, about 500 businesses have been closed uh, because they were sympathetic to, uh, to the protest one way or another. Workers that wanted to go striking uh, on factories, they were forced to go back to uh, working places and denied uh, their right to strike. Uh, so they were harassed, they were arrested, they were beaten, uh, they were smeared. Uh, so. Again, we, while we're talking about the ethical side of sanctions abroad, uh, somewhere in, inside Belarus, sanctions are applied all the way, full force. Uh, so now talking about the, um, the terrorism, uh, the designation of Lukashenko as a terrorist, I think there are many, many grounds for that. Uh, unfortunately, the, the procedures, international procedures, work in, in, in a very complicated way. It will take years uh, uh, probably to, to come to this point, uh, but we would definitely welcome uh, this step uh, to designate Lukashenko and uh, specific entities uh, with, from the law enforcement community. Uh, to uh, uh, to be named as such, uh, because this is exactly the case. Uh, the, the Belarus is uh, under under the threat of terrorism on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. We have just three minutes left, so I would like maybe to come back to Alias Bielatsky. Maybe he has uh, he wants to comment on what ha we have just heard, and I would like Andrei Dmitriev to confirm if he's still with us. I sent him a message. Да, если посмотреть на взаимоотношения Беларуси и белорусского режима и российского режима, тем более в контексте обострения ситуации между э, Россией и Украиной в последние недели, то можно сказать, что Лукашенко сейчас как бы пролаживает дорогу вот возможному развитию сценария э, российского гражданского общества, которое произойдет, если вдруг там начнется более активное действие гражданского общества в России. Вот эти примеры безграничной жестокости, подавления, он провоцирует практически российское руководство на более серьезное разделение его отношения к польской национальному меньшинству, к, свои, к нашим соседям Польши и Литве. Это еще является такой определенной провокацией, которая подталкивает вот этот союз диктаторов к более решительным отношениям к странам с молодой демократией, такой как Украина, или же к странам Европейского Союза. Поэтому, конечно, проблема демократии в Беларуси и прав человека в Беларуси, она будет сильно зависеть от того, насколько российская, насколько будет ли меняться российская ситуация, в какую сторону. Поэтому возможные санкции США против России, которые сейчас рассматриваются, и пакет санкций США против Беларуси, которые сейчас рассматриваются, это серьезная угроза для этих режимов. И я думаю, что нужно как-то рассматривать это все в комплексе и понимать, что, наверное, значительной степени решения проблемы Беларуси находится в решении проблем с демократией и свободами в России также. Thank you, Alice, for this uh, concluding remark, and it echoes what uh, Mikolai Patskayev was, was um, raising almost one hour ago. I'm really sorry we couldn't take his uh, question. He was mentioning the uh, arrest of, uh, I think, of uh, Mr. Feduta, and who's been extradited back to, uh, to Belarus, where he is under criminal uh, uh, charges. And this, again, uh, asks the question of um, how much should uh, sanction directed at uh, Belarus also involve 
Russia in the sense that they are uh, mutually supporting uh, one another. We will have to wrap up very fast, but I would like to give the floor just for one minute, please, uh, to Andrei Dmitriev. You're driving anyway, so you cannot uh, speak too long, and then we will have to finish. Please, Andrei. Thank you, Anais, and uh, hi to all. I just, <clears throat> I just wanted to say a few points. First, uh, I think when we talk about uh, sanctions or any other policies towards Belarus, it definitely has to be a way more faster than we have now. One of the approach to, to do that should be maybe stop uh, looking for the appropriate decision for all EU countries, but act already those who are ready. For example, uh, as Lithuania and Poland showed as, as, as an example, when they decided to uh, enlarge or uh, with a ban list just by themselves. So I, we, I think it could be way more effective when leaders of uh, Belarus, if I may say this, in Europe who are ready to act, whether we talk about uh, sanction measures or we talk about civil society support, will do so and the rest will uh, join them uh, afterwards when they are ready. Otherwise, we will stuck in, differ in many, many discussions uh, while the bad things happen in Belarus. Uh, the, the second thing I would say that we definitely need a way bigger support of civil society now, because uh, it's, it's clear that now the price just to stay in the civil society as an organization, as an activist is a way is a quite higher. And uh, uh, I think we should understand that this repression machine we have now, it is acting now, now it's mostly focusing maybe on people who are actively against the power. But once the power will decide that they already somehow deal with those who are against, they will open the new door of repression. It will be the clear repression inside of the power. And I think it's important for Western countries, Western politicians, and the, the other by the other instruments, uh, have it open the door for those from the bureaucracy system who will be ready because of that start talking and start and start uh, stand my last point uh, we, we you were talking so many about russia and about but i think it's a new quality of belarus belarus russian relationship right now we see and i think we are really first time in a big danger that belarus may step in into armed russian conflict and of course uh, now we could talk about uh, possible Ukrainian uh, conflict. And I think it's real, uh, re uh, really threat because now it looks like the only way for Lukashenko to get subsidies, to get support from Russia without having any other changes within the Belarus. Thank you. I was trying to be short as an ASU question. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, and uh, thank you for mentioning this necessity for um, uh, division of tasks because the tasks are huge and uh, not every country seems to be motivated to address it. Um, I have to uh, end this, uh, this panel now. I'm uh, quite happy with the discussion we had. I hope uh, we uh, address the issue of what the West can or should do and that uh, decision makers uh, eventually heard us, heard us, whether in, um, in the West or uh, in Belarus proper. Um, before we end the, the seminar, I can um, ask uh, Anna Morgan to show you the result of the poll uh, you took part in. Um, so uh, I hope that uh, this seminar has met your expectations regarding the practical recommendations uh, that uh, to, to the West about what can be done to stop human rights abuses. I think we addressed uh, some of the issues, maybe not all of them, um, and definitely the issue of uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, Russia, as usual, is maybe to be left to another seminar, which I am sure Chatham House will uh, organize uh, sooner than later. Uh, this said, uh, thank you very much to the panelists uh, for taking part in this event. Thank you to uh, the uh, audience for uh, being active and, and um, um, uh, my apologies to those who eventually asked questions on the chat and I couldn't take them, uh, but we are all in touch, I guess, and ce n'est que partie remise. We'll meet again, I'm sure. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a nice afternoon and um, see you soon.